Greetings and blessings. We've emerged from the holiday thankful and maybe a bit frantic as we join together now for a time to share, prepare, pray, and soul search. The Advent season is underway and propelling us swiftly towards the anniversary of our Messiah's tangible time on earth. Now is the season for watchful and ready. But there is so much to be done before the Christmas readiness is in place and heartfelt. And so we offer pleas and praises from our hearts to your heavenly altar as we pray and prepare for your manifested way. My family is thankful for the presence of your Holy Spirit at Thanksgiving. For my cousin, as she nears the end of her time on earth, grant she and her family peace and joy through the holiday season. Jesus, give healing to my cousin as she deals with cancer. God, be with the Ukrainian and Russian people as they have pain, loss, and fear in their lives. Thank you for a good Thanksgiving holiday and get me through the rest of the semester. God, strengthen families dealing with the impact of the economy. Father God, give courage to my family as they deal with my dad's new health news. Give grace to my former neighbor who is moving into a nursing home. Please help my roommate not give up and stay in school. God, aid my brother as he deals with problems in his life and his relationships. For all those facing impacts of the bad weather and flooding. God, give hope to the frail, the elderly, and those who are alone. God, help people dealing with respiratory illness, the flu, and COVID. God, help my sister as she grieves and prepares to move on with her life. That families who are divided by faith or faith may come back together by Christmas time. For those newly elected or re-elected politicians, may they do more good than harm for you and for their country. Heavenly Father, confident you hear these prayers and know those intentions hidden in our hearts, we ask you to help us to trust. Please affirm our faith in ourselves and others and keep us mindful to the joyful feelings of building your kingdom, even in times when the world's ebb and flow makes these things difficult. During the Advent season and always, help us refresh and renew our connections and commitments to building what we know we can with your grace. We pray and offer these things in your holy name. Amen. The Advent Antiphon. O oh God, wisdom of our God most high, guiding creation with power and love, come to teach us the path of knowledge. Greetings and welcome. It is our first broadcast in Advent. And there's not as much going on here on the campus in Kansas. Broadcasting from the Martin Meditation Chapel. Usually we would have the classes next door, but on the Kansas campus cycle here in Ottawa, the kids don't come back after Thanksgiving break. So there are people working on yard outside and people in the hall, but not the students and the sound of that, not the class next door. So it's an interesting thing as I'm thankful for spending time with my family, but I come back to that world that is a little quiet. And, and we don't have vespers and the kind of things that we've done here traditionally forever on the Kansas campus getting ready for Advent. So Advent is a quiet launch here in the campus and frankly, a quiet launch in my life. It, as, as you know from watching these broadcasts, will be the first Advent that I have ever had in my life without my mom's earthly presence, knowing that she's up in heaven. And so that changes my dynamics, the dynamics for the family. It's an interesting time of contemplation of mortality and thinking about uh, the timing and time of things. I've really, really thought a lot on what my mission through Advent will be this year. I mean, this seems like a really, really important Advent for me, a really important journey for me to be on as I get ready to celebrate the anniversary of Christ's birth. Advent's always neat for me. You know, if you're reading your devotionals that you got from us, that it's always neat to hear other people's ponders. But this year, I really don't know what to think about, to, to work on, to try to perfect within myself.
And I got two interesting questions from students for this broadcast. And really, as I thought about them, because I was trying to choose, it made me think that they both can go together. And maybe that's what, at least within my Lenten journey, I should focus on. And specifically, one had to do with someone saying that at Thanksgiving, their family talked about maybe we were living in end times. And that their mom specifically really, really did believe that maybe this was it. That we finally were towards the tail end and revelations was coming. And so those things would be manifested. And, and it had to do with revelations and whether or not we, we would speak more to that. And the other one was from someone who said, I'm in between uh, an argument with two roommates. And I don't believe either of them are telling the truth. What should I do? And it really made me think about sort of that Pilate statement when we talk about the passion of our Lord Jesus, where Pilate says to Jesus, truth, what does truth mean? He certainly, there's that issue where, where you heard in Mark that Jesus says, you know, basically be watchful and ready. And, and that there's all sorts of stuff that happens. Nation makes war on nation. There's going to be suffering. There's going to be earthquakes. There's going to be, and, and you compare that with those concepts of revelations that say that there's sort of a point of no return where those things go from foretelling to forthtelling. Foretelling is the sort of predicting what will happen. And forthtelling is saying, well, we sort of saw it coming. And we saw it coming enough times that it happened. And the concept of what does truth mean? Certainly, if you have a, a mom who thinks maybe these might be the end times, what we can certainly say scripturally is that it says a lot that nobody really knows the hour of that. So it's probably good to be watchful and ready to, to keep those lamps well stocked with oil, but not count on the fact that maybe tomorrow is the last day on earth. And that as long as there is time here in coil that we can keep doing God's will and maybe sort of postpone those things from foretelling to foretelling. So try again to get it right. But that brings me to the point of sort of being in the middle of those two roommates. And so that's an issue that says maybe both of them think they're telling the truth. Gosh, friends, we live in such interesting times where you can find stuff on the internet or that pops into an email or even see it on a billboard that sometimes says that things are true that, that I, really, I really feel aren't. And sometimes it says things are true that I know are not true. We are ripe with conspiracies and, and we're ripe with situations where people don't want to believe that history did that or the other. But they really do believe that. Even though that truth is not real, it is real for them. It's not as nifty as people being deceptive. And that brings into an issue within commandments of where is that time of false witness when you don't know it's false? We talked a few weeks ago about witness and those three phases of witness, the, the sort of martyry thing being the end, to martyr for something you care about, but first to see it, second to testify, to, to be able to go to the stand in court and say, yes, I saw it, and then to care so much that you're willing to die for it. It's just as easy to, to martyry, to martyr yourself for false witness. We as humans are so stubborn. We are built to sort of pack bond with anything. You, you put a smiley face on a toaster in your kitchen when you're in college. 20 years later, you can't throw the toaster away, even though it doesn't work because it was your friend in college. And we're pretty competitive which means we're built to defend and champion something. That's that issue that, that gets complicated when it's, when it's a golden idol. That's that issue when we defend the wrong things, but for the right reasons. My concern then for roommates and for myself as I deal with what I think is going to be my advent charge is to really make sure that I can examine my life and see that what I am witnessing is true witness. I'm doing the right things for the right reasons. I'm doing the right things for God and in his name. That I've not gotten pulled into some conspiracy that I don't see is conspiracy. That I really am clear what truth means. 
in a realm where God would say that he is the truth, the way, and the life, then I don't forget that in the din of what the world or politics or climatologists or professors or friends or family might show me on the internet. And I think that's probably going to be my charge to you at the end of the broadcast. But it really, really made me ponder how much of where we are right now going into preparing for Christmas is a world that is just noisy, but not a joyful noise. A world that is loud, but more yelling than singing. A world that is indignant, but not trying to make any real change in the name of God. And a world which uses the name of God to try to make a point, but not for God, for us. It is a time, I think, of false witness. And I think that maybe Advent is our time to say, we'll give it up. I could give up things for Lent. So we emerge into Christmas and beyond in a world that is more real and more true. And much more than an emulation of God. Glad to have you here. Listen to the psalm, listen to Mark, and then we'll get back together and sort of talk about what practically that means for us as we start this Advent journey. One thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple for in the day of trouble he will keep me safe in dwelling he will hide me in the shelter of his sacred tent and set me high upon a rock
As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, and John, Andrew, asked him privately, Tell us, when will these things happen? And what will be the sign that they are all about to be fulfilled? Jesus said to them, Watch out that no one deceives you. Many will come in my name, claiming I am he, and will deceive many. When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nations will rise against nations and kingdoms against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places and famines. These are the beginnings of birth pains. For Thanksgiving, we sort of had a, a drop-in dinner. Um, and it was dinner, not lunch this time. At the house where I spent my high school time. My youngest brother was born there. After my folks came back from the missions, we moved to a town called Overbrook, Kansas. And um, a neat old house designed by the same person who designed my house here in Ottawa. So it's over 100 years old. It was a, a man named Washburn, and he built sort of fun gingerbreadish houses. And it very much is a fun place where we did a lot of holidaying when my folks were both alive, and then even after Mom was still living. Christmas and Thanksgiving and birthdays would always be there. We hosted a lot of people, friends and family. The house has good, good room space and good flow and a lot of bedrooms. This, again, was the first time that I was there without Mom without anybody. That concept for me of saying I had wonderful family there and friends, but I was sort of an orphan. Well, mom and dad are both in heaven. I am that next generation that's sort of in charge of the family now in some ways. My, my parents both have some siblings that are living, but we as cousins now are moving into the place where I saw my folks. The house then was a good grounding space for holiday. I, I think about that as I reflect on Psalm 27, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and seek him in his temple. I spent a lot of time when I was there at the house getting ready for Thanksgiving stuff, staring at all the pictures on the wall because my mom has a million pictures. We have pictures of us as kids. We have pictures of mom and dad when they were young. We have pictures of grandmas and great grandmas. In fact, in our dining room, we have four pictures that are my great, 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 great grandparents. Um, one's a charcoal painting, one's a watercolor painting and some photographs. So we're surrounded then by the family and that family then goes sort of house to house. But whatever house has all the pictures of the family, that's sort of the space that we think about family in. It's the house of my family. A lot of those pictures I remember being on walls of my grandmother's. And so they just keep going, and we have more generations and more pictures, and thank heavens we have more walls. And So you're surrounded by people that are directly in your line. You're surrounded by pictures of cousins and aunties. And there's always those few people that are in pictures. You have no idea who they are. Probably 50 or 100 years ago we did, but we don't know now. But there are people and, and we're connected to them. And it's nice to have them smile as you digest, either during the meal or after, sitting around being sleepy. It feels like a house. It feels like a tent that's familial and it's there. In that house too, we actually have some stuff that was my mother's people, the Gilliland side, and it came over in a covered wagon on their trek to Kansas. So we have a big cabinet, this pie cabinet, that was in somebody's covered wagon because we always like to eat as a family. And then it's been around since it came around well, the late 1800s to Kansas, to the territory. It's been part of the family tent for a big chunk of time. So you really do feel like you're home because of all the stuff that is there. <sighs> That's a real interesting juxtaposition with things that would be hard to take out of your packs if you were trying to get that camel through the eye of the needle. That juxtaposition that says that that's my family, my people. And at a time when my family, my mom and dad now, are in heaven, that's incredibly important to me. To be surrounded by stuff that mom and dad loved and dusted and repaired. and It helps me still feel connected with the tangibility of them as earthly people. But they're in heaven. Where I want to go. So those things, although they make me feel good and safe and secure and home, are also things that could get in the way of me thinking about going to heaven. 
I don't like that juxtaposition. Now in Matthew, it talks about then deceit, you know, be careful what people say. To me, a lot of what I heard in Matthew 13 was about what we talked about when we started this, which is what does truth mean? I could psych myself up to say that being surrounded by familial things and pictures of my family would mean that I would not be able to let go of them to let God complete my eternal life. I suppose I could believe that, and I suppose I could allow it to happen. I mean, that's that whole concept that says you really can't take it with you, but you can try. It's harder to feel that way when I know that my family, not their photos, but my family is already where I want to go, spending an eternity with, with the God they loved, working that they emulated Jesus so well that they got to sit and gaze in his presence. They got to, as it said there, to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. That's what they wanted. That's what I want too. And I get to do it with them. But in the meantime, I don't think it's bad to sit around a Thanksgiving table surrounded by pictures of people that we love. I think that in itself is a reality then. And I think that that is a healthy reality. Now, I would not recommend that we do pictures that are not people that we love. I think that we live in a world where we'll find a lot of things popping up, and I certainly saw them knowing that I was home at Thanksgiving, as many people were, strange things that popped into my news feed that I am sure I never ordered or never clicked on, that were just trying to fish for a reaction within me. I do believe that some people earnestly believe things as fact that are not. Now, my kids and some of the students here tell me that there's a lot of people called trolls, and trolls on the internet just try to send you things that make you mad or to make you react or that say, of course the Holocaust happened. Why? I mean, they're just trying to cause you to, to sort of lose it or to feel bad. I think that's silly, and I really don't worry about it. And for me, I'm not easily inflamed by those people. But I'm terrified that someone would really believe something that was not true. I'm horrified, especially with historic things. There's all sorts of history within it, where people somehow deny something that we have the proof to know is there. I think there are times to take a leap of faith, but I also think that it, there are times where not recognizing that you have all the proof you need to understand that truth is fact is just delusional. I feel that it's so clear when I see that. But at the end of the day, what I'm not sure about is, am I doing that myself? Are there things within my world where I am delusional? Are there things that I think will change that I haven't admitted won't change unless either A, I do something, or maybe B, just won't change unless the rest of the world does something? In my realm of letting go and letting God, are there things that I really should be exerting my influence over that I'm hoping I won't have to engage with? Are there things I need to protect or preserve or defend are there things I need to champion? Are there things I need to witness? Am I being too dismissive because there's so much noise in the world that I don't combat, that I don't stand up for the truth? Not just in public, but in private and secret. I do worry about the climate. Here in Kansas, I think in Wisconsin, I've seen it too. Arizona as well. It's been a weird year. My sister lives in Hawaii, the big island right now. There's a horrible hurricane they're worried about. and It's just weird. Uh, I get confused if it's an El Nino or La Nina year, but one way or the other, the climate is changing. I don't know whether I spend time thinking about us changing emissions or whether I spend time thinking that it'll just get better. Usually that's probably it. It's just a phase. 
It's a phase the children are going through. It's a phase the world is going through. It's a phase the politicians are going through. It's a phase that Christians are going through. And we will be back to normal soon. We'll be back to what truth means. But what I'm realizing is that maybe this is the new normal. Maybe, like my Thanksgiving at my parents' home, now my home, I suppose, my family home, there will always be empty chairs and absent friends, although they are there in heaven, and I have to connect with them and memories of them differently because that is the new normal, the new fact, the new truth. So for me, I have decided that Advent will be a mission of seeking the truth. And not just seeking the truth, but trying to figure out what truth means. Where is the truth? Being a son whose parents are in heaven. Where is the truth in being in the generation now that people have to go to for advice? Because there's not other people above me in said generation. I felt that way when Roger Fredrickson went to heaven. Where do I role model for our students today, for my kids, for my friends' kids? Where we stand up and witness truth, even when it's not easy? When do I build the storehouses bigger or build a bunker? When do I recognize that there's things the truth requires? And when do I have the ability to really look at what I think is truth and make sure that it's just not my truth? Make sure that my perception isn't trumping God's truth. That really scares me. I don't want to be one of those people that believes some strange conspiracy when the facts are all laid out. I pity those people. What if I'm becoming that? So for Advent, that is my job, my soul search, my goal. To really make sure even if it means probing the obvious wounds, that both scripturally and in how I live life, because we've talked before, it's not the works that get you to heaven, but works keep you honest. The consequence of doing good deeds or bad deeds is how you know you're on a truthful path. That I really can set up a way to assess the level of truth I witness in my life. And that I use the palatability of God's grace to gaze at things that hurt. Because sometimes that's how we clean out those wounds. So that I can emerge in Christmas in relationship with an innocent baby Jesus that really needs to be surrounded by people who are clean and not infectious. That I can wear that mask around the elderly and the babies to make sure I do not infect them with something that I carry with me so that I can know that I'm clean and truthful. I would encourage that to be part of your charge. After this broadcast, going into Advent, that we together across the miles and through the magic of video land can join to make next year a truthful year, a factual year, a real year within the grace and grit that God's world requires. And that in that, with probably a little bit of humor, both dark and light, that we can laugh about what's going on in the world because we know we're doing something together to make it better and to connect it strongly with God's plan. Let us close then in prayer. God, we sort of have a charge together. Let us make a wadi, a promise from us to you, that we will recommit to doing your will and works, that we will not shy away from the truth of what is required, of what is specified in gospel. We will not be numbed to the din of the world to feel that things will just get better. We will have the ability to do tangible works 
turning other cheeks, going extra miles, putting broken people on our own beast and taking them somewhere to get them nursed back to health. Be attitudinally taking care of hungry and sick and clothing naked, making sure that where your tangible hands and feet are required, we report to duty to make the world better in your name. Help us then to be clean and clear in our assessment of ourselves, our partners, our enemies, and our world, to really know what is what and who is who, so that we can pray for our friends and pray for our persecutors, so that we, even for those that we are concerned about, can either influence to make their worlds better or let go and let you do so without judging or resenting that they may have a better life than we do now. Help us to do this in a mindful way so that on Christmas Eve, when we anticipate connecting with the anniversary of that vestige of God in baby form, God forcing and allowing us to interact with both the great and the small, the mighty and the innocent, that we can have the good behavior and the clean ways of not infecting, of not projecting our anger, our angst, our fears, our frustrations onto this beautiful baby that will grow into the savior of our world and our souls so that you will know that we get it And we really are working to be perfected so that your sacrifice is worth it as much as it can be in our small minds and our big hearts. We ask this now and through this season in your name. Amen. the heart.